Good morning everyone, welcome back to my channel. So, as you know, I'm back from Paris and in yesterday's video you saw my purchases. So what I want to do today and for the next, I don't know how many videos, it'll depend on how long it takes to work this project through. I want to create something to store all my bits and pieces from Paris. Now the main priority, of course, is the postcards. I mentioned it yesterday that I love um, postcards because A, you get a beautiful photo that, you know, I'll never, ever be able to take on my phone. Plus, you can get snapshots of a place and its history within the postcard collection. And they're nice and sturdy. So I don't need to worry about going and getting things printed. I've got a huge range of photos on my um, phone. And um, they're fantastic because I can flip through them anytime. Wherever I'm sitting, I can sort of go and, you know, flip through some photos. So I tend not to print so much photos from my phone. I tend to just buy some postcards. So I like the fact that I'm supporting uh, a tourism industry within that country or place, which is also nice to do. So I want to create something to hold all of these. Now, I also have a pile of stuff, you know, all the stuff you get from when you go on a holiday. So it could be tickets into museums, uh, business cards, just, just stuff. I'm not sure if this will be included in the project. It might just be stored, um, you know, as a reference that I can just find one day and go, okay, I'm going back to Paris. Let's revisit some of these places. So not 100% sure if I will actually create something for that. I think I'd rather just focus on the fabrics and storing these postcards. So a journal, if you will. But because it's very fabric orientated, I'm sort of thinking it'll definitely be slow stitch because that's my thing. Um, I want to create something that's sort of, I don't know. I've got a few ideas in my head. And I must admit, when I started thinking about it pre-France, it was all about a hardcover book. But I'm sort of now tending towards uh, a wrap. And while I was away, I was sort of mulling that sort of idea around more than anything. So the plan is to sort of maybe work out the base of it today with you guys and then sort of see what comes of it all. As you know, I tend to just turn the camera on and we just fiddle around until something comes out the other end. So whether this will be a three-part series or a 13-part series, who knows? Who knows? It's just, I've got a lot to tell you. I went to a lot of really great places and have some, um, lots of stories to tell you. So let's have a think about the construction of it. And then the place I want to talk about today was the very first port of call for us as tourists in France. And we went out to... Um, the abbey that is built on rock out on the west coast of France. Um, it was just amazing. Mont Saint Michel's. So we hopped on a tour bus, uh, Marianne, Chelsea, and I, and this was pre starting the textile tour. So we had a couple of days just to sort of scoot around and have a look at a few places. So we jumped on this tour that I booked online. We had to walk from our hotel across one of the bridges of the river, past the Eiffel Tower to the Pullman Hotel, and that was the meeting point for the uh, crew, uh, the, the tour group. So it was pretty simple. It was um, about a 15-minute walk for us. So it worked out quite well. We hopped on this coach and off we went. It was a 14-hour day, so it took just over three hours to get out there. And then um, the tour through the Abbey with the guide that was provided and then um, three and a half hours back and of course we hit traffic so it was nearly four hours back so it was a very very long day but um, we had a ball it was really really good it did rain when we arrived which was very disappointing because it sort of it, a shower came through and made it very muddy and slippery and not only did we have to sort of weave through this little town that's at the base of the abbey then you go up a series of steps until you get right to the actual abbey and our little package into included a ticket into the abbey and a guide to go with us to sort of explain everything. 
So just about killed us getting up there because you imagine it was steep. It was um, wet, slippery, so many people. Oh my goodness, there was just people everywhere. It was uh, crazy. So it's certainly um, an outing for someone who's very sure of their footing. So if you're heading over to France and you're a little unsure about some of the tours, this one I'd be a little cautious of because it was hard work and it was our first one. So we were not quite ready for all of the walking that um, was needed. It's not so much the walking, it's walking upstairs. As you can imagine, it's pretty, yeah, hard work when you don't do a lot of walking upstairs. So a little bit of this abbey. Now, it's a natural rock. This is my understanding. You've got to admit, I'm breathing heavily, trying to get oxygen into my lungs, and I've got a guide telling me all about the place. So I probably only got snippets of what was really there. But I'll give you a rough outline of what I learned. And then if you want to know more, just go and Google it because there's heaps of YouTube videos of people that take you through the whole process of the Abbey, how it was built, and um, give you a tour. So... If you want to do a little bit of homework and you want to experience some of the things that I'm talking about, hop on YouTube and type in um, uh, Mont Saint Michel's. It's um, really cool. So um, this shows it for, surrounded by water. That doesn't happen so much now because tourists have been traipsing in there and they've built a road. It sort of has ruined the way the sand moves around this island. So it sort of has created all of these sandbanks. Um, and therefore, the high tide doesn't really happen to this degree anymore. And there's a bitumen road now going pretty much across to the Abbey. This photo, I think I mentioned yesterday, I can actually see where it's photoshopped in around here. So technically, it's just all sand. All through here are all um, businesses uh, selling everything from beer to ice creams to postcards. You can imagine what that's like through there. It's just chaos. Now, as you come out of the visiting of the Abbey, you can walk straight down through the centre of their little town and exit, or you can actually follow that wall right around the outer edge, skipping all of that and then dropping down and then exit. So, see this behind the statue? This fellow here is at the very top of the Abbey, right at the very top there is this um, gold leaf statue. So, you can see that around it is sort of like sandy flats. The tide comes in and then the tide goes. So there was tours that actually took you for a walk out around those sandy flats around the um, abbey itself. So it was, yeah, there's just people everywhere. It's just, uh, it was the whole trip, there was just people everywhere. Leading up on the one side of the abbey are all these farms. And these little estuaries roll through these paddocks and there's all sheep that graze these paddocks. So it's a bit of a sight in itself to see these sheep munching on this grass and with this imposing rock in the distance where they've built this um, mini city and, of course, the abbey on top. I might just bring that photo right up close to the camera and you can see the abbey right at the very top. It's pretty incredible, actually. So the whole place was built in um, 708. So one of the bishops had some visions from St. Michael, he believed, and he was felt the calling to build this abbey. So it was a very good place to sort of build somewhere that was safe from the enemy. So around this time, the Vikings were marching through the place, causing all sorts of havoc. They did all settle down and sort of create a bit of a truce, and the Vikings sort of help populate this side of France and as we know it today Norman Normanby and it's sort of as a bit of a link through to the UK as well because the English Channel is right there so it's on that west side of France so but it was pretty pretty term, turmoiled um, that's not even the right word there's a lot of pillaging going on it was a pretty rough time yeah a lot of a lot of people have died in this region not only back back in the um, Viking times, but you can roll forward through uh, more recent history and there's been many world wars in this region and many lives lost. So it's quite a solemn place. Um, I guess the history was not lost on us as we were sort of hearing some of the 
the stories from this region of France. So, yeah, it's very, very interesting. The Abbey itself was just incredible. Um, I might show you a few pictures first from my phone and then I can concentrate properly. So, as you can see, let's have a look at this one. This is just a screenshot. And you see the sand around the base of that wall. So it makes it quite easy sort of to get there. And they've since built a road, a bitumen road, right up to that front gate. And then in you go. So the photos I took from the coach as we were driving out, canola everywhere, paddocks and paddocks of canola. So very big industry, uh, canola oil from that region. So another photo from the bus and you can just make out the abbey in the distance. This is pretty amazing. That's all the farmland leading up to the abbey. And it was a bit of a foggy, misty day. So it's quite imposing as you're heading out there, you're going through all this farmland. And then this just appears. Like you can imagine being a pilgrim, pilgrim or just someone wandering through this region and you come across this just yeah awe-inspiring so this is the road that we humans have now built out to the abbey so there's shuttle buses taking you out and then you can also walk it it was a couple kilometers from the main car park that you can actually walk out to it or jump a shuttle bus which sort of run you out it was a drizzly uh, rainy day so we end up jumping on the shuttle bus plus we had limited time we sort of had to get there get up and make sure we were back by like four o'clock to catch the bus back to town, back to Paris. So those are the photos I took as I was approaching the Abbey. It's just so, yeah, nothing like that here in Australia, let me tell you. So as I'm getting closer and closer, and you can sort of see the structures of the place. So it's literally built on a huge rocky outcrop and they had um, the schematics of the place where it shows the big rock and how they literally clad all of the buildings to the side of it. And as you sort of get to the very top, that part of the abbey has no rock under it, but the rest of it is stuck to the side of a rock, if that makes sense. That's pretty incredible. So that's now up the top, looking down at the road that we've built that everyone uses to easily get to the Abbey. So it goes for a fair way right back to a zone where there's toilets and parking and coaches right in the distance. And then you weave your way along this bitumen bridge into the main entry where you pay your ticket and in you go. And due to the building of that road, it's actually jiggered up all the movement of the sand. So it's always the way the moment humans get involved, that's the, tag hanging off of a stick of a tourist guide you know when they have a flag and you look for them in a crowd and you follow them so her I didn't realize at the time but her flag was in my photo so you can see that there's deposits of all this sand which has made it hard for that full high tide to actually happen like you see in that postcard it's more of a semi surrounded with water and these are some of the groups that traipsed out into those sandy areas to I don't know why, like seriously, why would you pay money to traipse out into that? And the guide was really strong on her comment that don't go out there because unless you know where to walk, it's a lot of quicksand and every year they lose a couple of people into the sand and they're just gone. They just die, unfortunately. But thousands of them were tour groups walked out into those mud flaps, flaps, oh goodness sakes, mud flats. So yeah, it was quite a sight so that's just traipsing up 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 we went through all the stairs there was little paths and then stairs and we finally got up to the top so that's the abbey itself and I'm out on a bit of a landing I've just sort of walked through a side door and they're give us, giving us a view um, of the outside before we actually started the tour inside now, we were lucky enough to be there on the day that there was actually a service being held. It was a Sunday and there was a special service going on. So that behind, above those little stairs there is people sitting down getting ready for the bishop to have his service. So there was music playing. It was just, yeah, amazing. Absolutely amazing. The sound that goes around that space is just, yeah, pretty impressive. 
and not to mention the architecture like it's just incredible so at this point I was feeling very romantic about it all and I was impressed with humans and how they built it and the the love and the care and the oh you know very romanticized all the stained glass windows and then as we sort of went through our tour we got more of an understanding of how it was not only built that's all timber in the ceiling incredible we also got a good understanding of how they live there now there's still 30 odd people live on this island to date uh, five monks and seven nuns help caretake the actual abbey and then there's shopkeeps that run businesses down in that bottom section so it's still very much a working abbey and as you can see here this is a better photo showing that people was now taking their seats getting ready for the bishop who is there getting prepared ready to take a service so that was a little bit special to see that so then we sort of left them in peace and carried on our journey through the place it was just ah uh, old this was a gorgeous area it was like a grassed area in this space where the monks would walk around take reflection quietly walk around and round and round and round praying and you could just feel it was a, just such a solemn solemn place so more views out of little windows you can see all the the sand that's deposited around the place which like i said it makes it hard to get that um, high tide to completely circle the abbey with water so little glass windows everywhere it was just just beautiful some gorgeous architecture this was the big hall where they would all sit and there was tables see those tables there which um, back when it was a functioning abbey to its full extent the tables would all be in a row and in silence they would eat their meals and if I recall two meals a day and they would have sign language to say you know pass me the the sugar pass me the coffee <laughs> pass me the salt and pepper because no one was allowed to speak so it would have been quite a quite a scene and then as we work through all of these rooms which were adorned with all sorts of um, architectural carvings and things there was the odd room that had massive fireplaces in them so that was for the visitors let's say the king or the queen came to visit or a bishop or a, um, someone of great importance within the government these rooms were where they would have a fireplace and they could at least keep their guests warm so they were sort of for the dignitary so that was interesting the poor old monks didn't get anything throughout the whole place there were chapels little private chapels and this was a chapel that was for the king and queen if they came to visit they could walk into this room and sit quietly and they had their very own little altar and they could pray so it was oh, very interesting so everything was going really really well and I was having a great old time until I got to this room now as you can imagine this thing is up on a rock so to get their food and supplies up onto the rock the guide was sort of saying to us how can you imagine this being done this was a big sleigh like a big timber sleigh so you'd take it off the rock you can see the hook holding it to the wall and you'd throw it out the window with ropes attached load it up and then pull it back up the rock now you can just see here a huge wheel and there's a rope you can see the rope and then you can see the wheel and you can see the sleigh so I'm walking into this space with stars in my eyes and admiration and you know all those things and then I get to this room and reality hit how does this abbey work and I guess the the human side of it so once this sleigh is thrown out the window and it's loaded up with wheat and flour and who knows what else this wheel is turned to crank it back up from the ground so how do you think they turn that wheel prisoners slaves it was terrible absolutely terrible so this big pulley system was cranked by the wheel there's the chain going down right down to the ground up through the pulley turn the wheel there's the sleigh and in that wheel were humans 
prisoners turning this wheel to get the supplies up to the abbey. So that was like, yeah, not so good. It was a little bit sad there, it sort of, yeah, it wasn't real good. A lot of the prisoners were political prisoners, so they were sort of uh, maybe going against the rulings of the time and were gathered up and used in the abbey as sort of slaves. Let's be honest, they were slaves. So in there, it was huge. You could stand as a human here walking around on those boards to turn this massive wheel to get that sleigh up. So there's another shot of the wheel. You can see this lady here compared to the size of the wheel. It was just huge. huge. And that, well, when you passed away, due to exhaustion most likely, lack of food, in you went. So when this abbey was starting to be restored, they found so many poor souls down in that hole. It's since all been cleared and, you know, everyone's been laid to rest. But that was the, you know, throw a bit of lime in, down the hole they went. So it was pretty full on. This altar here was sort of their last moment when um, a, I guess a blessing was given to them before they were chucked in the hole. And I thought this was interesting, the Greek alphabet A and Z, the beginning of time and the end of time. And then the hole was sort of just through that step archway there. So it was very solemn. That's a door to a prison hole. That's where they were kept. So a really present pleasant life for a prisoner not often these uh, high tides would drown a heap too it was yeah it wasn't real good so as romantic as the abbey was it definitely had a very dark side in the process of keeping the abbey going back in those days so we sort of left the area and just started making our way out of the abbey making our way back down to ground level so just some photos of the sheer height of the abbey walls random bells around the place it just yeah that's the the walk you could take around the outer perimeter to get down to the sand or we turned and went straight down into the village and made our way down past all of these houses down and out so that's my visit to the um west coast of france to visit the abbey so a couple postcards to commemorate my visit and of course i'm really loving these really old sketches of the abbey most likely completed 1848 this gentleman drew this image of the abbey and they've been printed onto postcards so enough about the abbey that was our story. I must tell you about Casper too. Let's try and work out how we're going to make something to hold these postcards. So let me get my cardigan off. It's starting to feel a bit warm. Now, I'm going to mock it up, I think, in calico, which is just cheap muslin calico in Australia, muslin in America. I think before I cut into my really good supplies, it's best I sort of get a feel for the process I guess out of this product first now I probably will still use it anyway because I want the wrap um, or booklet oh, I don't know what to call it yet because I'm really not sure how it's going to evolve I guess I want it to sort of feel quite substantial because there's a lot of weight in these postcards now sizing wise I don't think I'll worry about these big ones I think I'll frame those. They're quite large. Let's keep it to just a generic size postcard. They're the biggest. Yep, so that's our biggest. Let's put them away. I don't want to touch them too much because they'll get all dog-eared and ratty looking. So we definitely need a pocket for the postcard to slide into. How big is, where's my little tape measure that I showed you yesterday? I've already lost it. No, I don't. Here it is. My little tape measure, my Paris tape measure. Okay. Let's have a look at it. So the postcard is about seven and a half inches. 
So we probably need a three and a half inch pocket so that it doesn't flip flop around. And then probably three and a half inches at the top here. At the moment I'm thinking, um, of making it a pocket to the bottom, but a flap to the top. Does that make sense? I don't want them to fall out. You know, when you want to show someone your travels and you open up your, your journal or your, your container holding it and everything just falls out everywhere. I don't want that. Now my, my piece of calico here, straight off the roll, is 95 centimetres or 37 inches. So I'm going to leave it at that length at the moment until I work out what this thing's going to look like. And that has now been torn or ripped off and it's 36 inches, uh, 36 centimetres or 14 inches. So the theory is we have a pocket, we bring that down bit I'm not decided about yet is the bit coming down but I think I'm going to need it otherwise they're just going to fall out so this base if you will will wrap do I put it over to the edge of the postcard do we put Three in a row, four in a row, need another postcard. These are the biggest, so I've got four, five big ones. Okay, so I put the four of them in a row, and then I guess a gap between them. For thickness, what's the gap? I don't know what the gap should be. What should the gap be? Let's say an inch. I guess if we are luxurious, I can really bulk it up with lace. I can bulk it up with fabric. I can add maybe some of those tickets and bits and bobs. Maybe the four pockets could be broken down to the areas of which I visited. Wouldn't that be organized? So if we've got an inch between each postcard, an inch at the end, purely because I don't know, see an inch here, I don't know how we'll finish that. Maybe I'll make it a little bit more luxurious in case I want to do something tricky with that end. Maybe I'll do... That's two inches. That's an inch. Oh my goodness, I don't know how this is going to work out. But anyway, as long as it corrals everything. <laughs> I just don't want everything to go in the back of the cupboard, you know, the postcards and that. I want to be able to grab it when someone comes. Oh, I heard your trip to France go. I can just grab this out and say, it was great. Here's the fabrics I purchased all on this thing. And here's the places I went to. So that's sort of the theory behind it. So if that folded into there and that folded into there, we trim this excess off and then that folded into there, that is the theory behind my wrap. So then I can just lay it down on a bench and open it up and I've got the whole whole trip in front of me and then maybe maybe we need this flap and then some um, tie so you undo it and take it out 
this would need to be stitched down. I think if I don't do that, there's potential everything will just fall out. So I think that's my instinct is to do that, to keep it, to keep it secure. So I've got an inch and a half that side, an inch, an inch, another inch, and then at the very end, which you can't see, I've got an inch and a half. So I'm going to rip that fabric. Okay, so what I might do, I don't know if this is needed or not, but I might as well, while I've got it in this state, is put a few marks. Where's a pen? Fabric pen is what I'm chasing. Why can't I see one? There is. So let's just mark. Let's just mark the edges of the postcards. Okay, pen doesn't work. Oh, for goodness sakes. I've only been away a week. How come everything is not working? I think it's because I'm trying to write on a soft surface. Let's just slide that up. Slide that down and try and get so we got four pockets. Okay, so let's get our postcards out of the way. Bring this back up. So that's our piece. I've got four pockets, about an inch of space between each postcard. Sorry if I'm repeating myself, I'm sort of half talking myself through the project a little bit. Um, that pocket seemed to me felt natural. What sort of height was that? eight centimeters or three and a half, three inches. Yeah, I like the, I like that height. I guess it won't matter if that changes a little bit, but I think they need to be a decent depth. And then the piece down. Yeah, that's, Seven inches, or seven centimeters, three inches. Whether that flap is needing to be tied, maybe, maybe not. I guess the mechanics of it we can nut out. At this stage, it's just the the base. I think that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Now, I want to include. Um, like a booklet of lace. So if that's the middle, one, two, three. Maybe like our journal of stitchery, I can create some lace samplers. Now yeah, that would work. So thirteen centimeters, fifteen, five inches. So if I made them four inches. Yeah, maybe even four and a half. And that's stitched into there. Won't bump in. 
So what I'm thinking is creating some pages that can have some lace added to them. So journal pages out of fabric. same size oh how good is that so that's half so whether it's so in the journal stitchery when I'm creating a journal to hold my um, what do you call it stitcheries I would use this fabric as my base and then attach my artwork to these pages and I would put two together like this. I would do a stitch down here so that it became a little booklet, but leaving these sides open so that I could put some needlework here and stitch it on, some needlework on this side, and then the two would come together with a few stitches so that became the booklet. So what I'm thinking is doing the same sort of thing with this. Now, I guess the question is, if I stitch those pages into that gap, I could then have the postcards in the pockets and in between these little booklets that capture some of the morsels that I purchased, like some of the lace and things like that. So I could collage here. Now, how many would I want? Is the question. Is there any more scrap? No, nope. I have to grab some more off the, the roll. So I need a little bit more. So I've just grabbed my roll back out. Whether it's going to be too thick. Uh, who knows? So let's. I've made it a little bit smaller than the wrap itself so that it tends to disappear once the fabric all gets clattered to it. I hope I'm making sense. I'm probably not. If you've been stitching with me for a while, you'll sort of know what I'm doing, I think. Because it's the same principle as our journal of stitchery we've been doing with the Roxy Girls. Okay, let's get the salvage off. Let's lay that on there to get ourselves some more little bases, if you will, for our treasures. So that's two and two. So let's just stop at that for a moment, girl, before you get too far ahead of yourself. We'll assume that they're stitched together. Now I know Mary Ann has, and Chelsea to that degree, has a heap of uh, postcards as well so the girls are sort of hanging loose to see what I come up with and then they're going to make something for themselves as well Now the girls don't have uh, the fabrics I bought but they do have some of those touristy bags so the plan is that we'll use the fabrics from those to create their wrap or journal or whatever it is we come up with so throughout this series, I might flip flop around a bit and chop into those bags as well to sort of start creating wraps for the girls. So I must remember to get those bags from them that they purchased because they pick sort of slightly different designs to me. 
Okay, so I guess the question is, how, we've got three gaps. How many booklets do we put in? Definitely two, because they'll sit quite well within the wrap. Like that can move from side to side. I think I think I'm going to trim the fabric back on the edge. I'm happy with that and I can always build in a ribbon or something to think she's all over the place well I literally am my brain's just going how am I going to do that what's that going to look like sort of trying to envisage the end of the project so if I put all my fabrics over this slow stitch lace you know just go to town I will probably do something really fancy on the front but on the inside I might make it just one piece of fabric just simple and that will be used to cover my stitching is what I'm thinking. And then the pocket will come up. That will be stitched down here, here and here. And then this flap, I believe, will just stay as it is. I don't think I will... Will I keep it or not? I think I will keep it. I'm going to need to keep it. Yeah. So I need to think about what appears here and what appears here as we create the front. But that's a decision for another day. I think two booklets will be enough because they can lay like that within the wrap. at my postcards they'll just just fit because I've got an inch so that's all right that'll work so I'd say my internal seams I've allowed an inch at the moment will probably sneak back to maybe three quarters of an inch we'll see how we go and then these will be stitched in once they're decorated so what I might do now is create this little booklet so it's just a case so I'll give that a bit of a gosh it feels like forever since I've picked up needle and thread oh so how I have missed you I did take a little bit of stitching with me but I only did it on the way there on the plane. I sort of had energy and I was alert and, you know, excited about the trip. But on the way back, I was just too tired. I just was absolutely, absolutely buggered. Okay, needle and thread. There's my thread. This is just purely to stitch it together so that it's wrangled, if you will. It won't get attached to the backing yet. This is just a little booklet. Stitched together. Oh, let's make it easy on ourselves. I've got a crease, so I should be able to see my lines a couple of little well-placed stitches is all we need I can do a pamphlet stitch or just a running stitch it into position once we're ready and it would be a case of get the background wrap finished first then stitch it in and then make some little samplers of the lace I think 
We'll um, pretend we're a traveling salesman and we're peddling lace to some haberdashery stores and we pull out our, our book to show the shopkeeper what's available. So that's what these are gonna be, I think. It'll be a bit cute. sure I want four pockets I think if I go three pockets on that wrap it'll be too bulky so I think um, so that's our little mini booklet prepped that will just sit to one side and wait until we're ready so that allows me to do one two three four pieces of artwork and then um, I can join those pages together and that'll hide all of my stitching down. Now if you wanted to reduce bulk you don't need to do this you could just use one piece of fabric but I tend to like to do this it sort of makes it feel quite rigid in my hand too. I like them to sort of have a bit of substance. So where's the other one? At the moment I'm planning two but there probably is room for three. But I'm thinking this centre might need to stay free as everything heads towards it. I guess I could probably concertina it as well. You know, where you fold it back on itself like a fan. I could probably roll wrap it where we just like that. Is another idea. Who knows? I guess it's going to come down to how bulky it sort of becomes. So this is sort of a, a project you could apply to any holiday if you pick up some postcards and then if you're like me and a bit of a fabric person or a lace or trimmings, even if it's just touristy fabrics, um, this is a, a lovely little project that you could you could make to hold your postcards. So imagine if you were on a riverboat cruise through Europe, you could take the base like we're doing here with you. And then as you travel, morsels get stitched to it. It'd be a lot of fun. So I'm just doing my running stitch. Oh, Casper, what's the time? We've got 10 minutes. Let me tell you about that bloomin' cat. So pretty much I left home, got to Paris, settled in. We were there probably three, two days, two days. And we've got cameras around our house because, as you know, if you watch me for a little while, we had a break in last year, end of last year. So we've installed some of those cameras that you just can buy and motion sensor. So if someone's wandering around or lurking around, it um, sets off the camera and it sends you a little message on your phone to say, hey, movement's been detected. So one at the front door and... Um, one on either side of the house. The backyard has bandit and pepper. So if they're wanting to visit them, that's up to them. But to the sides, there's sort of no doggy protection. Anyway, um, it's late at night. I'm lying in bed and I hear the phone go bing, 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 bing. I'm thinking, oh, that's the camera. I can't sleep. I might as well have a little look. Now, in Paris, when I was meant to be sleeping, it was daylight, middle of the day here in Australia. So I look at the camera and here's my husband walking down the side of the house with his huge ladder. It's one of those extendable ones that would get you two stories in the air. He's walking down the side of the house um, with this ladder. I'm thinking, oh, he's cleaning the gutter with leaves. He's, why is he doing that? There's no one there to make sure he doesn't fall off the ladder. So I'm thinking, oh, goodness sakes, what's he up to? 
So anyway, the next day, a couple of hours later, I'm chatting to him. And I said, oh, what were you doing with the ladder? He goes, oh, you weren't meant to see that. He said, um, Casper's down the drain and he won't come out. I was like, oh my goodness, what is going on now? So pretty much, if I get a piece of paper, you'll get a general gist of what was going on. So out the front of the house, we have just a, a normal suburban street. So let's say that's our house here. Across the road is a little opening where if you're a pussycat, you could go down into there. And if you dropped down probably about 50 centimetres, there's a bit of a ledge. So if pussy was smart, he'd just stay there. But no, pussy's not smart. He drops down another metre and a half to the opening of a drain. So he is down here. So for him to get out, he's sort of got to trust that he can jump up now, knowing that that could be a wall. Like from his eyesight, he can't see that that's a ledge anymore. It's all right going down. He goes, oh, I can go further. But getting out is a lot trickier. He's got to have confidence that there's actually a ledge for him to land on. So anyway, if you are looking at the street, the drain hole is here and the lower part continues on under the road. So we're only talking four metres. So it's not very big. And then there's another drain here with a grate on it. There's also a grate over here. But this um, has got like this mesh there to stop leaf and rubbish going down into the drain and causing blockages. So to get out, you can't get out. The drain then does a turn under the bitumen and heads down the street probably about 15 metres to a huge drain that as the water lands here and bubbles out, it would then just go out into a paddock. Also tricky to get out, but possible if you were a cat, you could squeeze through the big grate. And this is huge, like no human can lift it type grate. So anyway, Casper's gone down and down into this tunnel, which then extends down the road a little bit nowhere else to go. So technically you can get out of here. Hubby ended up loosening this um, leaf guard a little bit. So pussy could get out there, but pussy didn't seem to want to. So every day, um, Gaz would lower this ladder. So <laughs> you're talking lowering a ladder into this drain, climbing down, and he barely had his head out at ground level, all right? So he's standing in this huge hole. At his knees is the actual entry to the pipe. So you've got to then squat down and look into the pipe to see the cat who was not coming out. So he called him and called him, wouldn't come out. Every night would go by, no cat. So I didn't realise because they wanted to, you know, let me enjoy my holiday, He'd already been in there two days. So Gaz was going down morning and night, trying to get him out, trying to call him. He wouldn't come. He was um, playing possum. He'd then give him food and water. He'd eat the food and water. The one night he saw him eating a mouse. So pussy's having a great old time. Husband's getting very stressed. Two and a half days later, I see the camera and realise what's going on. So then... Four days that cat was in the drain and the one day I was at, where was I? Remember I mentioned that I was visiting a, a church area and I just couldn't concentrate because it was just the cat thing happened. I can't remember the name of the church. It's in one of the postcards. Totally ruined my day. So we, we went to this fabric region Oh, for the life of me, I cannot remember that church. And it's because of this bloody cat. Because late at night, Gaz is down the hole trying to get Casper. I'm now midday in Paris having a gorgeous lunch with the ladies, waiting on an update on whether he got the cat. Now, the day before at another restaurant, we had the brainwave that if I recorded my voice on my phone, maybe he could use that to get the cat. 
So picture this, I'm in a restaurant, in the toilet, going on my phone, going, Casper, puss, 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 Casper, puss, puss. Oh my goodness, what a circus. So then Gaz could, I can't even find the picture of it. Gaz could then use um, my voice to hopefully lure him out. Anyway, it doesn't matter, I can't find a picture of this Abby. So um, that sort of worked. Pussies come out. Let's picture this as the edge of the hole. Gaz's feet are standing here. He can barely squat down to look into the tunnel, which pussy's in here. His head, <laughs> we'll use the cotton, his head just appeared out of that hole. Gaz's hand comes down, grabs pussy's head. Pussy slips back down the tunnel. Trust is gone. Cat hasn't been caught. So I'm at this restaurant. I've got a beautiful meal in front of me. There's 10 ladies and I get the text. Bad news. I grazed his head with my hand as I try to grab him. Cass was gone back down the tunnel. Didn't get him. And I lost it. I was just, I was exhausted because we'd been trekking all over Paris and worried about this cat for two days. And then I find out it didn't work. He had my voice recording. He um, had got a friend around to um, help him with the ladder because it was a two-man exercise. They had to, Gaz could put the ladder in, climb in. Then he needed a man to get the ladder out so that he could bend down to look down this tunnel to this cat who's sitting there eating a mouse. So I, I started crying. It was, oh, it was terrible. And then, of course, everyone's going, oh, you poor thing, you poor thing, which makes it worse. So anyway, I had to leave the restaurant and try and get me back together. So roll forward another day. That whole day was a blur. Luckily, it was just bulk fabric and it wasn't really what I was shopping for because, yeah, oh, it was just a, a blur. The next day, I woke up to a text to say that, it had been successful. Now, I'm going to read you the text because it's priceless. So the plan was, uh, back up a little bit. Kev, Mary Ann's husband, had come over to help Gaz on the Saturday night and then it didn't work. Can you come over on Sunday night, Kev, and help again? And Kev was like, oh, I'm sort of, oh, I'm a bit busy. Anyway, Mary Ann's texting Kev from France. Kev, you're going. You've got to help Gaz get this blooming cat. So anyway, the plan was Kev would come a second night to get Casper or attempt to get Casper. So we're waiting again. It's getting to midday. Our lunch is being served. It's like 9 o'clock p.m. in Australia. The boys are attempting to get this blooming cat again. So down they go, lower Gaz in, lower the ladder, pull the ladder out. Gaz gets down on his haunches to look down the tunnel. No Casper, not even a meow. The whole time he was meowing, he was chatting, nothing, absolutely nothing. So we're like, the boys are like, where's the cat? So they go down the road and look back up, not a sound. He's, he's not in there. He's completely vanished. Now, it's only like a 20-metre piece of concrete. There's nowhere to go. But could not, could not see him. So they're thinking, well, he must be out. Maybe he's in the, the block of land at the end of the cul-de-sac. So I'm just trying to find this message that I got from Gaz. And the deal was... I would um, give him a call through the night to find out what happened because I got this picture. Casper's at home eating food. That was what I got. I turned on my phone at lunch and I saw this. He, <laughs> he was back. And I was like, oh, thank goodness, the cat's back. He looked really good. Like, look at him. He's as clean as anything. He's been down a tunnel for like four days, giving us complete heartache. So, I, and Gaz sends fireworks, you know, the cat's back. It was hilarious, but it's not. So all very happy. And I said, look, there he is sitting on Gaz's lap, having a nap after his dinner. Like seriously, the cat. 
So I said to him, I'll talk to you through the night and find out what happened. How did you catch him? And uh, I ended up sleeping because I actually felt rested, like everything was, you know, sorted at home. So this is the message um, that I got from Gary that I read the next morning. I said, looking, he said, hi, I'm looking forward to your return. I haven't told you the Casper story. Kev and I were over, Kev came over, we went down the drain and there was no sign of Casper. The food had been eaten. We called out for a while, going down to the drain, down to the other end of the drain. We went down to the bushland beside the neighbour, couldn't hear anything. He must have gotten out. There was nowhere for him to go because we can see either end of the drain and there was no noise, nothing. Torchlight, nothing. We put everything away and were standing in the shed, having a bit of a chat. Kev was getting ready to leave. So we walked up the driveway, up onto the footpath, down to heading down the footpath towards Kev's car. We were metres from the footpath and we hear a meow. It sounded close. So as we approached Kev's car, there was Casper sitting next to the tyre. So we opened the pedestrian gate to the property. I called him in. Come on, Casper. And he just ran across the grass, down the footpath and in the front door. I've checked him out. He looks fine. He's had a big feed and now he's laying on my lap purring. Dead set. So much pain and misery and tears over that blooming cat. And he gets himself out of the drain and just trots across the footpath through the front gate into the house seriously oh i tell you that cat anyway that's my casper story i think we have a plan of attack here so i'm going to leave it at that i just want to think about all this a little bit more but i'm i think i'm pretty happy with it so i'm definitely going to have these little inserts i think one will go there one will go there and the whole wrap will sort of just come in on itself like so I think so that's the plan all right all right guys I will see you all in the next video and I think the next video will be about Versailles I might pop at the end of this um, uh, video some of the photos that I flick through on my phone so you can have a bit of a closer look at the beautiful Abbey all right look after yourselves and bye for now bye bye Hi guys, I'm back. So after I turned the camera off, I just sat here for a moment thinking about my measurements and I had to redo my piece because you may have spotted it when you were watching it. I marked either side of the postcard, which is fine, but then I had that inch as my spine or my gap. Now, then I turned off the camera and I looked at what I was doing and I haven't allowed for the postcard to actually go in and out of an actual pocket. So my marks, which were next to the postcard, actually needed to be back from the edge a little bit. And when I had a look at it on with my ruler, it's about six inches, which allows that card to slide in and out easily. Now, being on making pockets out of fabric, you sort of have to give yourself a little bit extra space because of the fabric and the bulkiness of it. So I ended up needing to tear myself a new piece of fabric, which was a little bit longer. Now, I've only got uh, three quarters of an inch at either end, which I think will be plenty. And I can always add fabric to extend if I decide to do something tricky at the end here. At the moment, it's not a concern. Then I've allowed a gap of six inches, but the postcard is only five inches. Does that make sense? Then my spine of an inch another six inches, an inch, six inch, so on, so on. Still planning on the four postcards as my width. So I've got a nice big space. So I just thought I'd come back, turn on the camera and show you that because, yeah, I pretty much um, would have jiggered it up if I hadn't have realised, so I'm pleased I did. So I've added probably another four inches to my piece of fabric. This is my original one. So I've still got the same height, but I've added another four inches, as you can see here. And that's purely space needed to create the pocket for the postcards so that they slide in and out comfortably. 
So I was going to talk about this in the next video, but I thought I'd better add it to this one in case you are pulling out some postcards from a holiday and you're planning on making something along with me. So it's pretty important that you have room for that postcard to slide in and out. I'm still planning on a three inch deep pocket and I'm still planning on this flap coming down so that they don't fall out the top. And I'm still going to have two booklets showcasing some of the lace stitched in there and then it will all close up like so. All right. That'll be it, unless I think of something else in the way of the way it closes. But at the moment, I think that's pretty much the plan. So in the next video, I can now start focusing. I'm going to flip it over so that I can still see these marks. I'm going to flip it over and I'm just going to start laying down some of the fabrics I purchased and um, yeah, collaging, I guess, the outer edge of it. Like I said, I'll probably just lay a piece of fabric through the centre here to hide all of my stitching, but that's, you know, another day. Um, so, yeah. All right, guys, I'm going to leave it at that. I just figured I'd better come back and tell you that my math was a little bit out. I'm going to put it down to I'm still traumatised that Casper did what he did to me. So that's why I got my measurements wrong. So let's, uh, let's blame the cat. All right, guys, have a lovely day and I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.